for everyone. Praise the Lord or whatever your flavor is there. This, uh, this, this series right n- that we're in right now is uh, You Must Be Born Again. And the one we're doing today is the call to repentance. Now, there's, some, there's been some, uh, some people think that once you become a Christian, you no longer repent. You only confess your sins. So confess your faults one to another, etc. However, repentance basically means to change direction. Very few people in life start out walking for God and get their direction exactly perfect. So we need to make constant course, course corrections to make sure we're going the right way. We're going to start in Matthew, the third chapter. And let me... Uh, go ahead and talk about uh, Brother Drost. The opening stories in this series come from the, the book Bill Drost, uh, Pentecost, missionary to Mexico. There was a little Boca del Monte, mouth of the mountain, other than an isolated, there was nothing there basically other than an isolated wooden end marking the beginning of the journey into the high country of Colombia, South America. Eucharist, a woman who was the first person to take the gospel to the mountain people, helped Brother Dross to a rope bridge spanning a river about 100 yards wide. A mule waited him on the other side for his ride to the top of the mountain. The climb up there, the path, if you want to call it that, uh, was sometimes the width of a man. Sometimes a precipice plunged far to the valley, valley below, and the trek but took most of the day. After reaching his destination about 7 o'clock that evening, he was laying exhausted on a bag of coffee. In about 30 minutes, more than 200 people had gathered to hear him speak. And prayer continued until midnight, and he told those who wanted to be baptized to wait a day or two so he could explain the scriptures concerning baptism. And early the next morning, a man named Julio came up to Bill as he was shaving. He says, I want to be baptized, but I'm not sure I can be. Why not? We see I have three wives. I don't know which to leave and which to take. <laughs> Seems to me I'll have to make a decision. Not everybody's going to be happy with the decision. He didn't say that. I'm, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> He didn't know what to tell the man, so he said, wait till tomorrow and I'll let you know. After that night's service, he took his flashlight and his Bible and went into the coffee bushes. They kneeled down and put his Bible in front of him there and prayed, God, there's something in your word that will settle this, I know. I don't know where it is, you'll have to help me. He let his Bible lay open, his eyes landed on the words from Revelation, first love. Bill thought, this can't be for the fellow, this is talking to the church. So he turned off his flashlight and waited in the darkness a while and said, Lord, reveal to me what you want. So he opened his Bible again, and first love was the first thing he saw again. It says, Lord, I don't know, but this is what you have given me, so I'll tell the man. So the next morning, Julio's waiting for him. He went to shave at 6.30 in the morning. He says, what's the answer? He says, I'm sorry, but I can't get anything else, only these two words, first love. That's it. Julio exclaimed, what? He says, I'm so glad the Lord has shown you because the first wife was the one I love, but she has left me. (laughs) I must go and get her if I can and try to bring her back so that we can live a Christian life. That's the way you repent. Okay, God, whatever it takes, that's that's what I got to do. In Matthew, the third chapter, starting in verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camels here, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him... Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He was not politically correct, just in case you were wondering. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance, suitable, something suitable for repentance to show you changed your ways. 
And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Then to mark the first chapter. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea <coughs> and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. And then in Mark, second chapter, starting in verse 1, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noted that he was in the house. And straightway, okay, let's just do a synopsis on this one, okay? There wasn't any room. Nobody could get in the door. So there were some guys coming with a, a friend they had who was sick of the palsy, and since they couldn't get in, they went up on the roof and they began to tear things up. And they let him down through a hole in the roof. And in verse 5, it says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And of course, you always got the ones that want to, they can't do anything, so they just criticize what is, does get done. That happens still today. So there were certain of the scribes sitting there reasoning in their hearts, and basically, they're accusing him of blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God? Of course, Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he goes, okay, you guys, why are you reasoning these things in your heart? Was it easier to say unto him, thy sins be forgiven thee, or take up your bed and walk? But he said, so that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And that's what he did. So, and then they're saying, we never saw it on this fashion. And then he left, he went down by the seaside, and all the multitude went down there, and he taught them. But he said, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And then in verse 15, and it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat and in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees, this seemed to be a troublemaking lot. When they saw him eat it with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, people go to church and complain, criticize, or even quit because everyone there isn't perfect or their version of perfect. But see, that's kind of like walking out of a hospital because everyone there isn't a doctor or a nurse. Guess what? You're going you're gonna to attend church with some sick people, some people that need help. Get over it. Acts 17 and 30, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And all men, men there, basically if you look up in the Strongs, it basically means human being, not only men as opposed to women. All human beings it has to do with your countenance, man-faced, yeah. So, let's get into this. As Jesus pointed out shortly before his ascension, all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. This is from Luke 24 and 44. That one through verse 49, some of my favorites. One of the earliest of these things to be fulfilled in the New Testament was a prophecy of Isaiah concerning John the Baptist. Now, a lot of Jewish people do not accept Jesus as the Messiah. And I'm beginning to wonder if they accept Isaiah as being a prophet. Because he prophesied so many things about Jesus. 
and I mentioned to one about, you know, the, the virgin birth and stuff being, for, uh, being prophesied in the Old Testament and coming, he says, I don't believe in the virgin birth. Well, we'll pitch out that book of the Bible, you know. If you're not going to believe what the Bible says, it's your Old Testament, your prophet, oh well. Matthew 3 and 3, this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Also in Mark, which we, we read, and then Luke, the third chapter. It's important to note, though, two key words in Isaiah's prophecy, the voice of the Lord, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. These two words are Lord and God. These pronouns identify Jesus as God himself. It's in there if you look for it. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Lord represents the Hebrew Yahweh, sometimes rendered as Jehovah in English translations by which God identified himself to Moses. You find this in Exodus, the third chapter, and in the sixth chapter. But the Hebrew word translated God in Isaiah 40 and 3 is the form of Elohim used of of the creator in Genesis 1 and 1 and a lot of other places. Now, if someone asked you how Jesus could be the Lord God, how would you explain it? We need to be ready to explain some of these things to people who don't understand. Jesus said, I and my father are one. I know some people have seen, have said, you know, well, that's like a husband and wife. And when they're married, you know, they become one. It's like, Never have I been able to tell someone, when you've seen me, you've seen my wife. But Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There is a difference. Well, how can he be the Father and the Son? How can he be the Lion and the Lamb? How can he be the Great Shepherd and the Door of the Sheepfold? How can he, you know, come on, folks. Wake up. So, the first recorded words spoken by John the Baptist were, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That the message of repentance was John's mission is re re uh, reiterated in a variety of ways in the Gospels. Luke wrote of John, He came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Um, like Matthew, Luke connected John's ministry with Isaiah's prophecy, but Luke extended the connection further. If you compare Luke 3, 4 to 6, and Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. Now, Mark also made clear that John's inaugural message was the necessity of repentance. In Mark 1 and 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Mark, like Matthew and Luke, saw John's ministry as a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 40 and 3. Now, Metneo, which is translated as, as repentance, refers to changing one's way of life as a result of a complete change of thought and attitude with regard to sin and righteousness. Again, as you walk with God, he will give you more direction. You were off to a good start, but you need to take this away. Like Brother Jeff Arnold said, he explained this years and years back. You have to abstain from some things. You have to add some things and adjust the rest. It's that simple, living for God. Now, when he tells you to abstain from something and you go, eh, I don't think it's that important, don't expect to get any more enlightenment or word from God. The Lord told Brother Mahaney, I can't bless you past your last disobedience. So if you're not going to do what he says, don't expect him to keep talking to you. This is what I got from Word Genius, which I subscribe to. Metanoia, a transformational change in one's way of life, a change resulting from repentance and spiritual awareness. The two definitions they had for it. Um, so since scripture wasn't originally written in English, it's necessary to capture not merely the English definition of a word, but also the way it would, the word would have been understand, and understood by those of that time period when the scripture was written. I don't know if you've ever watched some of those things, but I've, I keep looking at, these are words that came from another language, or this is what it meant in the 1500s, 
And in the 17 or 1800s, it meant this. Now it means this. So you have to go back. And a lot of times, even the words that you see in there, when you have look at the English version, you have to look back to see what it'll say, like archaic. Well, that's probably the one they were using when they translated the Bible into English. So anyway, since English, in English, a focal component of the word repent is the sorrow or contrition that a person experiences because of sin, the emphasis in the Greek text seems to be more specifically the total change, both in thought and behavior with respect to how one should both think and act. So whether the focus is on attitude or behavior varies somewhat in different contexts. And that's from the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament. Uh, okay. Isaiah's prophecy about the ministry of John the Baptist pointed specifically to Jesus. Nobody else could fulfill what Jesus came to do and what he was doing. So it's not like people got confused and thought that, you know, it was somebody else and Jesus kind of stepped in and it was a mistake. Um, John's focus on Jesus, though, wasn't limited to Isaiah's prophecy. He made it known from his comments about Jesus and from his interaction with Jesus that Jesus was superior to him. But wasn't he said, I mu he must increase, I must decrease? He didn't know that that meant decreasing from here up. That's how it turned out. And lest you think that you're special, Jesus said there's not a risen a greater than John the Baptist. Okay, we'll move on. John knew his own ministry was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. You find that in John 1 and 23. But he also knew that Jesus was the promised Messiah who would take away the sin of the world and baptize those who believed on him with the Holy Ghost. In John, first, uh, first, in John first chapter, verses 29 to 36, you read what he was talking about those things. Now, for people to be prepared for the coming of the Lord, it was necessary that they first repent. They need to change directions. They need to turn their lives around, change their thinking. That's always the first step for those who want to see the salvation of God, according to Luke 3 and 6. We've got to keep in mind that the legitimacy of baptism has always depended on the faith that precedes the baptism. You can't just grab somebody off the street and say, come here, in Jesus' name, and push them under. Yeah, it doesn't work. It has to do with in here. Well, in here. This is a, yeah, one of those things. I always can get confused where it's an analogy or a simile or a metaphor or a, so we just call it a that. Yeah. You don't think with this. You don't feel with this. It's, it's all up here. But as illustrated in John's ministry, this was faith in the Lord whose way John proclaimed. John preached about the Lord when he said, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. And he said, I have indeed, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now, this declaration anticipated the day of Pentecost, which was coming, when Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit on those who were waiting and who had tarried and waited for that. Now, just like John the Baptist came on the scene in fulfillment of a prophecy of Isaiah, so did Jesus. Matthew connected the beginning of Jesus' ministry with a prophecy from Isaiah the ninth chapter. Anybody familiar with Isaiah the ninth chapter? Starting in verse 1 and 2, he said that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region of shadow of death, light is sprung up. That's from Matthew, the fourth chapter. <coughs> now, following these words, Matthew wrote, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now shortly after this prophecy in Isaiah, the prophet said, For unto us a child is born, 
Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, the contextual connection uh, between Isaiah's Galilee of the Gentiles and David's throne and kingdom demonstrates that Jesus' message wasn't intended only to the Jewish community, although that's what he did say when he first started out, because he did come to his own, his own received him not. And it wasn't just for them a first century Israel, but it was also for the Gentiles, or as Isaiah 9 and 1 has it, Galilee of the nations. Now, whether Jew or Gentile, the message of repentance is introductory. After believing on Jesus, it's introductory for entry into his kingdom. Because you're not going to do anything if you don't believe. If, if you don't have that, nothing's going to happen. In other words, sorrow for sin alone doesn't open the door to God's kingdom. Repentance is required. Now, God forgives when we repent, but the stain is still on our record. We're baptized for the remission of sins. They are remitted, which means to cancel or refrain from exacting or inflicting, inflicting a debt or punishment. So when you're baptized, the stain or the record is gone of your prior messes. You can, you can clean up after a baby, but sometimes you have to erase all the stuff, the mess they made. So Jesus went to the sinners. Pharisees and scribes who didn't believe on Jesus complained, This man received the sinners and eateth with them. Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep. Jesus' behavior that offended the Pharisees and scribes was the purpose for which he came. It wasn't like the scribes and Pharisees were doing anything to win him. Of course, they didn't have the, the change that was coming. Remember, those of you who have studied this, dispensations. A dispensation was a span of time in which God dealt with man according to a certain plan. We cannot build an ark today and hope to be saved. We are not saved today by refusing to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So today it's repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost, which we know is with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. That is the one for today. The, before up until, um, up until John... So the law and the prophets were up until John. Then there was a transition period from John through Jesus and end up until the day of Pentecost. And after that time, we're under the dispensation of grace. So we cannot look back to Jesus forgiving the man on the cross and saying, that's all you got to do is say, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's not going to work today because there is another plan. So in the... In the parable of the 90 and 9, the 90 and 9 just persons were those who thought themselves to have no need of repentance. They represented the Pharisees and the scribes, and the one lost sheep was a repentant sinner. Now, this compares a little bit to Jesus' story of the Pharisee and the publican who went up to the temple to pray in Luke 18. The Pharisee was praying, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of everything I have. In other words, look at how good I am. But the publican, the Bible says, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And in verse 14, Jesus said, the publican went down to his house justified rather than the Pharisee. It wasn't about who was outperforming who. The account of Jesus' call of Levi illustrates Jesus' mission. We read that along right after the, the healing of the man with the palsy where Jesus forgave his sins. The scribes and Pharisees questioned Jesus' willingness to eat and drink with publicans and sinners. 
And just like in our opening text, Jesus said, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, if you want to try confusing yourself and making yourself wonder what the Bible says, what's the difference between the righteous and the holy? Start looking at it, trying to figure out what the difference, what the difference between the um, unrighteous and the wicked. As far as I can tell, the unrighteous are the ones that have it in here, but they're not acting on it, but the wicked actually act it out. I'm not quite, I'm not too sure that either one of them is going to make it. If you don't have it down here, even though you're going through the motions, you're going to be in a tight place. Or as Brother Jeff Arnold says, you're going to end up in a bad place. So, as in the parable of the lost sheep, the righteous are those who think they have no need for repentance, while the sinners are those who acknowledge their need for spiritual recovery. Now, we listened, we listened to a, um, a presentation by a doctor talking about her recovery from cancer and things, and one of the things that she said that stuck with me the most was, contented people are hard to warn and that's why Brother, brother uh, Jesse Williams, our pastor back in North Carolina, we were stationed at Fort Bragg, he said, you know, he said, the problem with, with a false religion is it's like a vaccination. It gives you a weakened strain so that you build up a resistance to the real thing. And so people go to a church that does not preach full truth, but they get a little bit of truth and they think everything's fine. John the Baptist wasn't politically correct. Jesus wasn't politically correct. And I try not to be. You got to tell the truth. That's more important than being politically correct. You can go to heaven with hurt feelings if you insist. Now, according to the Bible, that people that love God's law, nothing shall offend them. So if you're offended, don't tell people, because they're going to know you don't really love God's law that much. Some view God's commandments as suggestions. It's a bad mistake. Well, I keep this one and that one, and I do this and I do that. What about this? Well, you know, I, I asked a guy one time, have you ever thought that, you know, you might be wrong? Oh, no, I, I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I'm, you know. If you're not, if you haven't repented, been baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins, in other words, taking the stain off your record, and you haven't spoken in tongues when receiving the Holy Ghost and you're living a clean and holy life, according to the Bible, you're going to have a problem at the end. Contented people are hard to warn. And when you follow a few commandments and just disregard some of the others, you're not quite there. You cannot do partial and get by on it. If what Jesus told about the judgment, about the servants standing before their master and him saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant, or you wicked and slothful servant. Do we expect God to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, if we're not good and if we're not faithful? He's not a liar. We shouldn't expect him to lie for us. So repentance is not a suggestion. It's a commandment of God. When Paul visited Athens, noting the pervasive idolatry there, he said in Acts chapter 17 that God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now, to be sure that the Athenians understood the scope of this command, Paul explained that God, he said, hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. 
and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Okay, note here, although God is close to us and actually everywhere, you're still not going to find him without seeking him or feeling after him, as Paul said. Now, after announcing the universal nature of the command to repent, Paul said, though, telling those who heard him there on uh, preaching in Athens, that God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world. And that's when you got to be ready. Now, if you're not ready today, hopefully this isn't your time to go. Because though the judgment may be several years down the road, there comes a time when it's over for you and you're just waiting for the judgment. The ability to repent is a gift from God. There is no predestination. You were not born on a collision course with disaster, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, God has given every one of us the option of changing direction, and his word tells us which way to go, which course to follow. When Peter explained his experience at the house of Cornelius, the Jewish believers glorified God and said, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Luke 13 and 3 says, those who refuse to repent will perish. So when, when, we, when we obey this universal command and experience baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, we have the promise of forgiveness and of the gift of the Holy Ghost. He said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This was Peter in Acts 2.38. So, repent and be baptized, and ye shall. Now, I, I would think that a person could not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost if they had not repented. And I think that sometimes people repent on the spur of the moment. Yes, I've got to change direction. Once they get the Holy Ghost, it's, they, they kind of put it on cruise control and say, well, I'm, I'm good now. You're not good now. You're in the door. If you stand too close, it's lava to shut with you in it. So we should not get satisfied because we have taken one step. There's more to it than that. Now, let's get into something probably, I don't know, maybe controversial to some. Are there some people for whom it is for whom repentance is impossible? Well, this this is from the forward thing on the on the the minister's forum from UPC. This man wrote, I am not a judge nor do I carry the spirit of one. However, I do know what I know and I know what I felt or feel and felt. Have any of you ever dealt with blasphemous statements made to your face? with a defiant pride. I have. When somebody was saying, I'd rather go to hell than go back to that church. God's listening. In fact, sometimes I try to avoid some things because I know some people are really stupid and they say stupid things. And God doesn't care how stupid you are. So in, he says, in my case, this happened with a woman that has family four generations deep in our church. This woman, having had the Holy Ghost for several years, four or five, completely denouncing the salvation power, the truth of the message, the hope of it, etc. This happened with her husband on his knees and face in my office floor, begging her to stop talking. And of course, because he loves his wife, he, he said later, blaming it on her state of mind, Medications and current life conditions. If you're on medication that make you do something like that, you need to get off that stuff. And then he says, if you've had such experience, how did you move forward with that person and the family? In 27 years of ministry, the most scary, heartbreaking situation I've ever dealt with. Now, can we expect God to accept something like this because we lost control? We were in a bad mood, or we were having a bad day. Well, I was mad when I said that, so, you know, 
God understands. He understood every word you said. Well, I lost my temper. You better hang on to that thing. I'll get you in trouble. I don't remember who it was. Was it Brother Haygood or someone that said that you are never closer to demon possession than when you lose your temper? Because once you have lost control of your emotions, the devil can move in. You better keep things under control. In Ephesians 4, 26 to 31, Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, Be ye angry and sin not. He said, Let not the sun go down on your wrath. And verse 27, And to neither give place to the devil. Remember that one. That's some good instruction right there. Then he goes into, if, like if you're stealing, don't do it anymore. But work as you may have to give those in need. And he said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. In verse 30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and so on. In James 1 and 26, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religious religion is vain, which basically means empty. Now, people have heard of the unpardonable sin. Brother Seagraves, Dr. Seagraves now in that was our instructor in Bible college. He said to say that there are certain sins that God will not forgive is like saying, well, Jesus' blood was only good for so much, but it's not good for everything. However, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Starting again in verse 26, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. <coughs> I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, fortunately for us, God does extend a lot of mercy. And where at all possible, His mercy will, will override His judgment. But there comes a time when He finally shuts it off. Now, some people will say, well, you know, it's just scare tactics in this, like, you need to be aware. If you're walking across a rope bridge with, a, with bad rope, somebody needs to let you know. That's not scare tactics. <laughs> that is letting you know that you, this could be the end if you mess this up. Mark chapter 3 and verse 22, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath bales above, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. That's a pretty bold accusation against Jesus. So he goes on to tell him a little story, and then in verse 28, he says in 29 and 30, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme, which is to vilify or to speak derogatorily about or whatever. That's when you're gossiping about people and calling them names and stuff like that. Yeah, that's blaspheming that person. However, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And then he goes on in verse 30 to explain why he's saying this. Because they said he hath an unclean spirit. They had accused Jesus of having an unclean spirit. Basically what they were doing was attributing the works of God to the devil. 
Yeah, that's not smart. Now, from the Gospel According to Mark by Sidney Poe, and if you want to look him up, Sidney L. Poe, in, um, on the internet you can. He's got quite a, a list of accomplishments and degrees and whatnot. He said, Jesus provided hope in the forgiveness of sins. All sin can be forgiven, even blasphemies against other people. However, the one sin more grievous, more horrid than all the others is a sin of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Jesus issued a warning because of a verbal accusation against the divine power of God in Christ, for the religious leaders attributed the incarnate love and power of God to Satan. How opposite is the function of the Holy Spirit to their accusation? First, the Holy Ghost reveals God's truth to humanity. This they refuse to believe. Second, the Spirit endows a believer to recognize truth when confronted with it. This they denied. When someone denies the works done by the Spirit of God for human benefit, he rejects grace and truth. By this rejection, he spurns and turns aside the Spirit. When this becomes a permanent attitude, he cuts himself off from the possibility of accepting forgiveness. When religious leaders in their prejudice and malice hinder the work and influence of God by claiming that it's Satan's doing, they put themselves in peril of entering this state. Some so-called preachers actually profess that present-day speaking in tongues is of the devil. That is a dangerous place to go. To be in danger of eternal damnation may be read like in the, uh, I think it was the English Standard Version, is guilty of an eternal sin. And then he says, from which there is no turning, and the sin remains. In John 9, uh, 39 to 41, Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they, might, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be blind, made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Yeah, think about that one a while. That's a real brain twister. <coughs> but whenever a person refuses to accept revealed truth or denies the Spirit of God access to their life, they soon lose all semblance of spirituality. Unused muscles atrophy. And soon, they cannot walk. Denial of truth soon results in the inability to discern truth from error. In 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, verses 10 to 12. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they, shall, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, if you look at that first 10 verses of 2, Corinthians 2, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, you will find a lot of stuff that's going on in the world today. It's not good. But people are justifying it, trying to make it normal, trying to make it okay, trying to push it off on the rest of everybody to accept. It's not okay. I don't care if the rest of the world says so. Like Brother uh, Tim was teaching last Sunday, truth is truth. God is truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If he, if he inspires his writers to put it in the Bible, don't try to find a way around it. So the goodness of God and the evil of Satan are to a blasphemer indistinguishable. That's why you've got people going haywire because they denied the truth. They wanted to twist it. They didn't see anything wrong with this, didn't see anything wrong with that. Next thing you know, they don't see anything wrong with anything and everything's okay and we're all going to the same place. We are not going to the same place. Barclay quoted Rawlinson. These are theologians, commentators and stuff who called blasphemy the essential wickedness, the epitome of all evil. Henry Sweet said, to identify the source of good with the impersonation of evil implies a moral wreck for which the incarnation itself provides no remedy. Of the sin of blasphemy, religious leaders are more in danger than sinners. 
Sinners can pretty much just ignore everything and just go on their happy way. But there comes a day when there's a day of reckoning and they have to accept. I've got to make a decision one way or the other. But if they have spurned God's overtures of mercy so long, they don't care. But the Jeff Arnold, back in 1994, at preaching it because of the times, he was preaching away and everybody's having a good time and all of a sudden he said, if you can't be lost by, uh, saved by works, you can't be lost by works either. And after they got done sucking all the air out of the room, people started canceling meetings with him and all kinds of stuff. You've gone nuts and you're crazy and everything. He said, on the way home on the plane, he was asking God, what'd you, why'd you give me that? Why'd you make me say that? He says, you've ruined my ministry. <laughs> but he said, God began to talk to him. He said, you're not lost by works. He says, well, what do you mean? Well, if a person sins, I send conviction. So he started taking notes. Well, what if conviction doesn't work? He says, I send chastisement. Okay. And he has some scripture for it and stuff. What, but what if chastisement doesn't work? I send open rebuke. Now that's in the New Testament. Turn them over to Satan. Publicly, you know, let, that they're, they learn not to do those things. He says, what if open rebuke doesn't work? I send judgment. Of course, he's taking notes and everything, and he even mentioned the open rebuke. He said, God didn't appear to um, and Nathaniel with David. I think it was Nathaniel. He said he didn't, he didn't go to him in his uh, bedroom. He said he embarrassed him in front of his whole court. That weren't the man, David. And then he said after those four things, he said, well, what happens if judgment doesn't work? And he said it was like nothing there, just a blank blackboard, and all of a sudden it said reprobation. That's a scary word right there. We've talked about it before, but reprobate basically means worthless, unacceptable, unable to be purified. Because when they were purifying metals back then, they would, they would take the metal, they would apply more heat, more heat, more heat, more heat, and the impurities would break loose and they'd come to the surface and they'd, they'd skim them off. And they put more heat and more heat and more impurities to turn loose and come to the surface. But after so long, if they couldn't get the impurities out, they would stamp it, a docimos, can't, can't purify this. It's unpurifiable. Now, if they stamped it docimos, it was acceptable, it was purified, and it was able to be used for trade, for money, for whatever. Of course, back then, they actually used real silver, gold, or whatever for, for money. They didn't just print a bunch of paper that was not worth anything. So, basically, when a person gets to this state... They have lost the ability to determine right from wrong. And again, that's a bad place to be. And I have more, but I've only got about a minute and a half left or so, so I'm not going to go there. Um, I will, yeah, I'm going to go ahead. Brother Dros was supposed to be, was supposed to be having a, a baptismal service, and... Um, it was about a one-hour walk to where he had needed to go a place that was suitable. So he's laying on the, his coffee bag. He had a vision. He saw a white horse, a little short man with a red face, and in front of the man a pool with ducks swimming in it. And so he pulled, told the people about his dream, and they said, oh, we know who that is. That's the man we all work for, Senor Fandino. He says, well, what about the pool of water? He says, he has a pool, but he's not in favor of the gospel. He says, well, just tell me where he lives. About a five-minute walk from here. So there he went. So he was standing before the man he'd seen in the vision, and Senor Fandino knew of Brother Drost, and he says, may we use your pool to baptize some people, Senor Fandino. He says, why do you want to baptize them? Were they not all baptized when they were children? And he told him, well, this baptism's different. Now, if you don't understand, sir, and you can wait, he says, oh, no, I'm leaving now. He says, well, you wait. He says, I can hear him coming now. And with that, almost 100 people came down the mountain path and stood around the pool waiting for baptism. So he excused himself, he got into the water, began telling them just why they were being baptized, 
And after a short time, Senor Fandino shouted in English, wait, mister. He said, can I be baptized? He said, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you have repented, you sure can be baptized. He ran into the house, came back in his pajamas, ready to be baptized. He baptized him in the name of Jesus, and he came out of the water baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. This is the kind of Holy Ghost I like to see people get. Says he was so filled with the Spirit that for four or five days he could hardly speak a word in Spanish. He just worshipped and worshipped. I hate to see people get their tongue tied a couple of times. And people say, well, they got the Holy Ghost. Let's move on and try to pray with somebody else. Nah, you got tongue tied. The Holy Ghost means you're going to be back in service the next service. You're going to change your life. You're going to do some things different. You're going to be living the way God wants you to. But God calls everyone to repent. And when we repent from a sincere and humble heart, he promises to forgive and fill us with his spirit. All around the world, the power of repentance is being experienced and the Holy Ghost is being poured out on all those who call on his name. Service at uh, 1105. Come on, put your hands.